So good afternoon and good morning to all who are joining us today on International Women's Day. Um, the session is brought to you today by PWN Global and MaidenVoyage.com. And your presenter for the day is Carolyn Pearson, who is the founder of MaidenVoyage.com. Um, Carolyn's going to be telling you a little bit more about Maiden Voyage in just two minutes. Um, firstly, I'd just like to give you a quick overview on PW Glo P PWN Global and who we are. So PWN Global is an online and offline networking organisation, and our goal is to support women to achieve their potential. We also work with organisations and society at large to make balanced leadership and normal professional practice, which it currently isn't, unfortunately. We still have a lot more work to do. Um, you've probably seen a lot of the press today on International Women's Day, which has been covering this aspect of why it's important that we celebrate this day. PWN Global started partnering with Maiden Voyage back in January. Um, we realised that our goals were, our organisations had a natural complementary fit. Um, PWN's 4,000 members are predominantly managers and leaders with international roles and profiles uh, from across 90 nationalities. And alongside the 600 physical events that we offer in over 25 cities around the world, we offer each year um, our, our members a free mentoring program, a whole plethora of webinars and several networking opportunities. So now it's really great that we're able to offer our PWM members also access to a special agreement that we have with Made of Voyage. If you want to find out more about PWN Global, then please visit our website, which is pwnglobal.net. And I will be in touch with you all following this uh, webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Carolyn. Carolyn, are you with us? A warm welcome to everybody who's joined us today. Um, hello from myself here in England. We've got attendees who've joined us uh, from over 20 different countries, ladies for as far away as Australia, Azerbaijan, Sri Lanka and Switzerland. And of course, good morning to you ladies and gentlemen who've joined us in the US. Um, we also have some guys who, do, who did join us today who are security specialists and you're looking to make travel safety better for your female executives. So um, a big hip hip hooray for you uh, to, to, for joining us today. Um, and as we all know, today is a very special day for women globally. In the times of the world and for our less fortunate sisters, wherever they are. And with this in mind, I'm simply honored to be running today's webinar in aid of the Women for Women International. Since 1993, Women for Women International has supported 429,000 of the most socially excluded women survivors of war in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, Kosovo, Iraq, Nigeria, Rwanda and South Sudan. And with over 20 brutal armed conflicts across the globe and unprecedented levels of violence against women, there's never been a greater need for women to um, for, sorry, for Women International, Women for Women's International work to support women survivors of war, which is why this year Women for Women International has launched a program in Iraq to support Syrian and Iraqi women affected by the conflict and the instability in the region. And the She Inspires Me campaign, shining a light on inspirational women and girls globally. Through Women for Women International's 12-month program, women learn about their life and vocational skills to access livelihoods and to break free from poverty. Women for Women International works hard to engage men in the work that they're doing, breaking down prejudices and practices which, which prevent women from reaching their potential. And in fact, after the 12-month program that they do with Women for Women International, their earnings will see an increase uh, from just 39 cents a day to $1. $1.49 a day. So if you do feel moved by the work that Women for Women International are doing and you have the opportunity to join the She Inspires Me campaign or sponsor a woman through the one year program for £22 a month, then you can help the change the world for one woman at a time. And of course, today's webinar would not have been possible without the kind support of Doorjammer, who we'll be learning a little bit more about later on today because they provide travel safety devices for hotel rooms. 
So I'm quickly going to just tell you about Maiden Voyage, not take up too much time for the content of the webinar, and uh, just tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, so here's a quick agenda of the training that we're covering today, and so some uh, interesting material to share with you. So Maiden Voyage is an organization that I launched back in 2007 because I found myself traveling um, regularly on business ending up in the most glamorous cities around the world but actually sat in my room having room service or sitting in a restaurant by myself. And I figured that there must be lots of women like me who are sitting in hotels all around the world who could be having a richer, more interesting cultural immersion experience when they're traveling on business. And so I set off with a small task of creating a global network through which women could connect and have dinner or do something nice in their spare time when they were traveling. Lucky for me, um, the press really loved the idea and we've been featured on uh, all kinds of different media, including the New York Times and CNN who were pivotal, pivotal in uh, launching the Maiden Voyage brand for us. And as a result, we have now over 8,000 members in over 80 countries. So it's a free service, you can sign up and you can connect with other women when you're traveling. We also have a scheme to safeguard their own business travelers and allow them to connect through our network around the world. And I know that we have some of you members today uh, joining us on the webinar. We've seen you come in, so um, a warm welcome to you too. We also have um, around about 45 ambassadors around the world. Our target is 100. And these very special women are here to offer you advice about their local cities. So, for example, if you were traveling to Johannesburg, you could connect up with Celine and she can give you information about that city. Our ambassadors can um, advise on anything from the local business etiquette, the dress codes, to social protocols, but also they can share their little black books on nice things to do, safe places to visit, and nice restaurants that aren't always on the tourist track. Um, so if anybody on the webinar today would like to become one of our ambassadors, then feel free to, to drop me a note. There's lots of advantages. You can represent me at nice events around the world, but also it's a fantastic way to promote yourself or your organization to, to our members and just to really get yourself a friend in every city in the world. We also provide safety tips, so you'll see them on our website, um, and some of these tips will come from our safety training, and you're going to get a lot more in-depth information in this webinar. We also recommend female-friendly hotels, so we have hotels around the world that we've physically vetted um, for both safety and, com uh, com and comfort, and so uh, many of our members will come to us and say, can you give me a recommendation for a hotel? So our members can access an online inspection sheet so that they can inspect hotels for us, which means that we're gathering intelligence on both the excellent and the not so excellent hotels around the world. And each of our hotels offer perks such as upgrades or spa treatments so that Maiden Voyage uh, members um, can tell the hotels if they want to when they're checking in that they're inspecting. And if they're not a Maiden Voyage hotel, then they may well um, roll out the red carpet for you or at least give you a, give you a nicer room. So that's a little, little tip from me. Um, if you let a hotel know that you're going to be inspecting them, it also helps to just drive up the roads around the world. If you have a travel booking policy with a travel management provider, you should continue to book um, hotels through that, that channel. And our corporate members, we will also send a list of our preferred hotels um, to your travel manager so they are aware of the hotels that we've inspected. So that's a, a, a small copy of our hotel inspection list there. And uh, as I mentioned, um, there is an opportunity to, um, to have them roll out the red carpet for you. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. Um, we also provide female traveller safety training, um, so this is a, a subsection today of a, a, a one-day training course that we do. Um, we've tested this course on some of the world's best um, travel security specialists, in, including um, governing bodies for travel security, but we've also tested it on the likes of British Transport Police and um, close protection officers who work for various royal families. And we also deliver this training on behalf of the British government who um, it, our work helps them to encourage more women into export. So um, I'm going to get into the details of the webinar. Uh, feel free to ask questions and uh, she will pass these over to me um, sort of midway through. 
Carolyn, so oh, there, yes. one thing, yes. um, there is a survey that we're going to run throughout the course of the, um, the session today. Um, we're just going to be asking people, as a female traveller, have they ever experienced um, a situation that they didn't feel they were able to handle uh, whilst they were travelling? So I'm going to launch that survey. And while you're talking, okay. people just want to fill that in on the left, on the right hand side of the screen. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so why am I even running a travel safety webinar today just for women on International Women's Day? Of course, you, you can't shout back to me, but um, just take a second to think about that. It's, it's the age of equality in lots of countries, not all countries, um, and some countries have still got a long way to go. But why would I even run a webinar just for female travellers? Well, there are some specific reasons. Um, there are legal restrictions impact, impacting women traveling to certain countries. There are impacting women. We are, unfortunately, through statistics telling, telling, telling us that we're more prone to sexual assault, that whether that's physical or verbal. We are often less stronger than our male counterparts, and I'll cover why that's an issue as we get into the material. But also, we carry our lives around in our our handbags and that means that all of our travel plans, our um, communications devices etc are all um, in those bags and as we know handbags are very attractive to thieves. But the good news is that, the, that most of us and of course not wishing to stereotype, we do have a good sense of awareness and we are constantly on our guard when we're traveling and thinking and planning ahead because of our safety concerns and of course we do have that great instinct and I'll be talking a little bit more about using that as we go into the session. But really the purpose of today's session isn't to scare you, I'm going to give you lots of information because I want to inform you, I want to empower you and I want to liberate you to have the most amazing travel experiences. But just to, to touch on some of the detail of the, of the risks that I've just raised here, the cultural impacting um, and, that, and there's, a, there's a risk around generic advice. So if we look for example at some of the issues that you might face traveling to different places around the world. It's actually illegal for a woman to drive in Saudi Arabia. If a lady reports a sexual assault in the UAE, she could be at risk of being charged with having unlawful sex. Inadvertently taking a copy of Cosmopolitan magazine into um, a Muslim country could land a lady with a sentence of lashings. A gesture of platonic friendship in Egypt could be misconstrued as romantic interest or sexual availability. Smiling at strangers, particularly in, in countries such as Bahrain, um, particularly men, is discouraged. Initiating a handshake or making eye contact could be seen as flirtatious or highly offensive. Hugging a colleague who you know well from the West in a public place in the Arab states, again, is um, putting you at risk. Travelling with a man who is not your husband in Saudi Arabia could lead to your arrest. Eating alone in a cafe in Libya could be an issue for you. You not deserve. Women into Saudi Arabia unless their husband, a sponsor, or a male relative will meet you at the airport. And there will be males whose religion forbids them from shaking hands with women. Thinking about our dress for a moment, if you are flying to Iran, your hair needs to be covered when you enter Iranian airspace. So that's before you leave the aircraft. And until not too long ago. Wearing trousers in Malawi and Swaziland was illegal. Wearing bright lipstick in Iran will attract unwanted attention, and hair should be covered up at all times. But also thinking about um, nail polish, perfume, heavy makeup, can you see the list goes on and on and on, whereas our male colleagues, when they're traveling, they just put their suit on and off they go. So Maiden Voyage ran some independent research into the issues facing female business travelers, and you can see these on the screen now. 31% of women felt that their employer didn't adequately take care of them. And in some cases, uh, when we delved into this, that was justified. And in other cases, employers did a, quite a good job, but what they didn't do a good job was communicating the travelers was not available to them. And only a very small percentage had received the type of training that you're getting today. Sadly, one in four women had suffered a negative or an adverse situation whilst travelling on business, so it would be interesting to see your feedback on the poll. And I think as professional women, sometimes... So, so on, the, on, excuse me? on the information that we've had through from the survey, 16% yeah. of people more than once have had a situation, 26% right. have had once, 
and just short of 60% are saying never. So that's slightly higher than your original stats. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And I think also, as professional women, we just kind of get on with it. Um, and, you know, if you, link, if you think back, maybe this evening when you're reflecting, then you might actually think, actually, I did, have a, I did have a situation, but I just, you know, got on with it, which is what we tend to do. Um, and in terms of where these um, these issues um, occurred, you know, some cities you might think, oh, yeah, I think that might be a little bit scary for me. But actually, what I want to ask uh, with you is female and I think your biggest um, enemy is complacency. So always prepare for your travel wherever you're going, not just cities that you um, that you've never been to before. And in terms of women, where women said that they felt the most vulnerable. 51% said that they had felt vulnerable at some time in the hotels allocated to them by, by their employers. But interestingly, um, they weren't always comfortable saying that. They felt that it could be career limiting because some, sometimes they needed to travel for their jobs and if they couldn't do that travel then they might not be extended those more senior positions. 55% said that they felt nervous in a cab because they were at the mercy of the driver. 67% on public transport and 67% again when walking in a new city. Lots of women said that they also felt uncomfortable dining out alone, hence why I created Maiden Voyage. Um, but actually I know we've, besides um, the large organisations who we've got joining us today, we've also got some small micro businesses and some SMEs. And which means that you might start to use a sharing economy such as Uber and Airbnb. And also you could be using cheaper hotels and maybe staying out of town because they're cheaper. And of course using public transport. And you may not be able to afford the large insurance policies that large organizations can also afford for their staff. So we do, um, we do understand the challenges facing you. So how can you keep yourself safe when you're traveling on business? And we, we did a course this week, and, and I think um, one of the key points that came out was if you get rid of all the travel admin and you get all that done really well in advance and some stuff you can continue to use time after time after time with a little bit of preparation, it leaves you free to have a successful and fruitful business trip and it also keeps you much safer. So I'm going to look at from control risks, we with control risks, and I can just look at that. Now, what you will see are some um, amber green um, red areas on the map, and these are hotspots which are um, known travel risk areas. But I, as I said earlier, So um, well, I've just talked about some of the issues facing you um, as a female and to just be aware of the um, <clears throat> excuse me, generic advice. Let's have a look at what you can do when going to a different country or even you know, a different city. Check out the country that you're traveling to. Think about the social economic conditions. Are they the same as what you have at home? Are they, do they have um, a higher GDP or a lower GDP? And how might that impact you as a traveler? Think about not only the crime rate, but the different types of crime in that country. Think about the government. Are they stable? Um, are they not stable? Are they reliable? Are they trustworthy? Are there elections due? Are there any anniversaries due? What about the judiciary system? If something happens, do you feel comfortable that you can actually report it to the local police? Is kidnapping prevalent in that area? And if, if it is, what type of kidnap? Is it local? Is it gang stuff? Or is it actually um, what we would call express kidnap where they might take you to um, a cash machine to, to empty your bank account, for example? and or any um, religious issues or conflicts.
So thinking about your document preparation, um, most of us will be traveling with a passport. So my recommendation is that you have at least two hard copies. So you have your normal passport, you've got a photocopy of your passport, which you would keep in uh, your luggage, but also um, store a copy of your passport in the cloud. Now, if you travel quite a lot, um, it could be that you've got stamps in your passport which don't allow you to go to other countries. And I know, for example, that the British Embassy will allow a duplicate um, passport. So again, you might want to check that for your own um, country if you're allowed to do that. And then you may also need to hand your passport in. Some hotels will ask you to do that. So make sure that you've got a second piece of ID that you're traveling with. Thinking about preparing your telephone before you go, make sure that your phone is activated for global roaming, so it's actually going to work in the country that you're traveling to. But also, um, it's worth checking with your mobile phone provider that you will be able to get voice messages when you get to your country as well. I was recently caught out where my voicemail works in every, every country about, apart from the one that I've just been to. But also pre-program all the numbers into your phone so that you've got them if you need them in an emergency. Um, and make sure that you pack your charger and an adapter in your hand luggage so that you can use it as quickly as possible. Um, also have contacts back at the office, of course, so that you can, you can call back there. But any details of any um, insurance that you've got or any um, travel risk management companies or medical evacuation companies that you've also got them um, programmed into your telephone. And if for whatever reason something happens and you do need to be repatriated quickly, make sure that the embassy or the consulate knows that you are, you are there in country. Contact them immediately, but perhaps before you travel, um, just check that your embassy or consulate actually exists in the country that you're traveling to, and if not, then understand um, who the backup embassy will be for you because all the embassies will um, support um, various um, brothers and sisters, if you will. Um, thinking about um, when you get to your, uh, your destination, uh, make sure you've got the contact details. If you're going to see um, a supplier or a customer or if, you, you know, if you're heading out to a rural, rural area, make sure you've got the details of the people that you're going to see. Uh, but also have a look on Google, look at Google Maps to see where their offices actually are. Is it you know, in suburbia or on an industrial estate or is it in the middle of the city? So you get a feel for the place that you're going to. And if you go to your hotel first, then uh, maybe you could ask your hotel concierge to check out um, the area that you're going to and make sure um, that it, it will be the same when you leave as when you arrive. And what I mean by that is if you um, think of uh, cities such as um, London's Canary Wharf, uh, very, very busy during the day, but actually in the evenings or at the weekend it's less busy um, and also less transport. So just um, try and understand what the transport options are to get out of a place as well as get in there. Um, looking at your insurance, of course, make sure that you have adequate cover. And a note to the SMEs who are with us today, um, you may be traveling on business on your personal travel insurance. Just make sure that you are actually covered um, when you're traveling um, for work. And also think about the different types of cover, so not just uh, repatriation, but if you need any uh, medical support in that country. Um, and then thinking about cash a little bit, um, I would always take some cash for the local um, country that I'm going to, so take some local currency. Um, I wouldn't advise that you stand at a cash machine um, in an airport. It is a public place, and for someone to see you drawing, uh, withdrawing large amounts of money in the airport um, could put you at risk. Um, but also check that your bank card will actually work when you get to that country. And if you've got a new card, make sure that it's activated for international withdrawals. And remember that most bank cards have got quite a low daily limit, so um, you might need to make multiple trips to the bank if you haven't got um, sufficient means of payment. Now, I'm going to share with you some top tips on luggage. Um, obviously, um, obvious signs of wealth um, in less affluent societies could make you a target for theft. So you may well have bought yourself a nice set of designer luggage. Well, whether that's having your luggage um, stolen or your belongings stolen from your luggage in transport, you're more likely to do that if you've got expensive looking um, luggage. So I think um, obviously exercise common sense in terms of where you're traveling to, but you might want to consider leaving the Mulberry and Prada at home. Well, besides the inconvenience of losing your belongings or your travel documents, cash and credit cards, if you have your bag stolen, it could leave you, as I mentioned earlier, without a means of communication and seriously disrupt your travel plans. 
Now remember not to have your home address on the outside of your luggage and not have that visible, but have it on the inside of your suitcase and just have a name and a telephone number and make sure that, um, that they are safely inside your case so that if your case does go missing, um, there's a chance of you be re re being reunited. Also, so we use a visible padlock. So if somebody's going to steal one of two suitcases and one has a um, a padlock on and one doesn't, they're most likely to steal the one that doesn't have the padlock on. And of course, if you're going to uh, the USA, you will also need a TSA lock on your suitcase. Um, now, if you're traveling with a fairly innocuous piece of luggage because you want to blend in, you also want to identify your suitcase quickly when it's coming around the luggage belt. So, of course, um, make sure that you've got a nice strap or something on the, on the suitcase, but again, not overly feminine, so that you can identify that or the luggage tag could be quite bright. You can identify it as your suitcase, but it's not identified as a female suitcase. Um, Bag theft, unfortunately, is quite prevalent on the, on the um, trains, so make sure that you keep your bag visible, and that could either be above your head, or actually I like to put my suitcase between um, two back-to-back -back seats, because you can generally get them quite close to where you're sitting, or actually I've discovered that um, hand baggage size suitcase will actually go under the, your seat on the trains, um, so that's a, a good place to keep it, or if you do have to put your luggage in the luggage rack, then just make sure that you, that you check it. But you may also be able to get yourself a bag that splits in two so that you can zip off the piece that's got all your technology and your valuables so that at least you can keep them close to you. And in terms of a handbag, you could also think about taking one with a long cross body strap which you could then um, wear under your coat or jacket so there's less chance of somebody stealing your handbag. Um, and we have heard stories in some countries of thieves splitting the bottom of handbags for things to fall out. So, um, moving on to packing, I'd like to say that I am the packing queen, um, but unfortunately I probably take more pairs of shoes than, than days when I'm travelling. I've still not mastered the art of, of packing light, but I have got some best practice to share with you. Um, so, packing light, of course, does keep you agile. It keeps you mobile and it keeps you efficient, and it means that you don't have to check your baggage in. So, it means that you're not held up by um, disruption or bags going missing. But don't pack more than you can actually carry yourself, and that goes back to the point I made at the beginning about women being less physically strong. If you're struggling with a suitcase that you can't get up the, um, the underground or metro stairs, then you're going to enter into a conversation potentially with someone who's going to help you with that suitcase. So again, um, it, it makes you less independent. Um, a good tip um, is to wear your heaviest items, of course, for traveling, so that will save on some packing space. Um, and also um, try to carry your laptop in an innocuous bag, as these are really um, commonly stolen items. And I've seen some lovely um, laptop bags that don't look like like laptop bags. Um, also, um, keep a pre-packed toiletry bag with miniatures in, and of course, if you're going to be traveling hand baggage only, then you would need to carry transparent sealable bags um, just to take your liquids through the airport. And with a little bit of thought and planning, you can get many outfits out of just a few pieces, allegedly. Um, and of course, rolling pieces together helps um, prevent the creasing. Um, and also, pack some clothes so that you can blend in with the locals. And one of the tips that we got from um, somebody who we trained a couple of weeks ago was that she just dresses right down. If she's not going straight to meetings, she'll be traveling in jeans and sweater and trainers, just so that she's very agile. She's flexible, she can move around quickly, um, and she can blend in with the locals. And of course, you may want to avoid obvious signs of your nationality. So um, you, you might be very proud of the university that you went to, but actually that's going to identify your nationality, um, and that not, might, might not always be a good thing in the country that you're traveling to. So be sensitive to the local dress codes. Do you need to um, think about modesty? Um, do you need to carry uh, an abaya or a headscarf maybe? Um, so find out um, from our ambassadors or from your colleagues who've been to that country before um, what the local business dress code is. And for some countries um, where it's notorious for getting unwanted male attention, you might also want to think about wearing a fake wedding ring. Um, and one of my travel wardrobe staples, of course, is a pashmina, which I will take for covering up in sacred buildings, to wear as a headscarf, to put over my shoulders, um, and also to use as a blanket on chilly flights. Um, also, um, feminine hygiene product 
products may not be available in every country that, that you're traveling to, so you might want to take a stock of them with you. And my top tip is that I always carry um, some really comfortable flat shoes that I use for zipping around the city, you know, running up and down the uh, stairs for the metro or the underground and navigating strange cities and then I just take my heels um, for when I get to my meetings. So at least I know that if I need to be able to run, I can run um, in the shoes that I'm actually wearing. Again, thinking about where you're traveling to um, might suggest that you leave your expensive watches and jewelry at home and they could make you a target for theft. Um, we did have one lady, unfortunately, who had uh, necklaces um, off twice ripped off her throat, uh, one on the Paris Underground and one somewhere else. Um, and I have already mentioned um, carrying your charger and an adapter with you so that you can, you've always got access to your telephone. So moving on to when you arrive in your country, um, hopefully um, you know if um, you've got a driver waiting for you, it's easy to identify that person. And of course, not everybody has the luxury of a driver waiting for them. But if you do have, um, I've got some top tips in terms of keeping yourself safe. Um, when that man stood there with the, with the name plaque on. Um, Anybody could copy those nameplates, but likewise, we've had incidents of people walking up to somebody who's carrying a nameplate and saying that that was their car or they were that passenger and jumping in the car and pinching somebody's ride, which means that you, you're left high and dry and maybe at risk at the airport. So if you can communicate in advance with your driver or your transport company and agree um, you know, how you're going to identify each other, is it with a photograph or I like to use a password and I, I did that recently with a company and they gave me a password which was actually the registration number of the vehicle that I was getting into. Now thinking about um, when you're getting to the destination that you're going to, um, Make sure that you get there in daylight hours so that at least you're not disoriented, you're not tired from you know, just having woken up from a long, um, a long flight. Um, so think ahead. Um, when you get there, what's the, what does the journey look like between the airport and where you're going to? Is it 10 minutes? Is it an hour? Are you going through rural areas or are you going through suburbia? Are you going right through the city center? Are there some landmarks to look out for? And this is a really good one um, for you to ask your colleagues if they've been to, say you're going to visit your offices in New York and you've never been there before, you know, what kind of things can I look out for? What will I see en route? But also we've got some examples of ladies who we've trained who've gone to places like Russia or China and they've tried to articulate um, the name of the destination that they're going to. But actually, because that was written in English and not in the local language, um, the drivers didn't know what to do with them. And in both cases, they were just ditched at the side of the road because the drivers were driving round and round in circles and had no clue where to take these ladies. So do think about um, how you're going to communicate um, with your driver. Now, um, underneath we've got a bug out bag, sorry for the military term, but we don't really have a nice term, um, but it was taken um, from, the, uh, from, from the military and basically it's a bag, obviously you wouldn't have all these things in your bag, um, that you can pack quickly um, or just before you go to bed so you can grab it if you need to leave your hotel in an emergency. And it might not be a real emergency, it could just be that somebody set off the fire alarm, but there can be nothing more annoying than standing outside at four o'clock in the morning or queuing in reception um, in your pyjamas and you can't get back into your room. So with a little bit of planning, if you've got um, a bag where you can um, put your room key, um, you know, maybe a torch or your mobile phone, you could have a torch on your mobile phone, um, maybe some cash, some shoes, so anything that you think if you need to leave that room in a hurry, um, you can grab it. Um, so when you walk into your hotel room, think about where you have put that room key rather than just um, popping it down anywhere, which is what I used to do. Um, now I'm going to share with you um, some a short list of medical considerations to think about and we're going to briefly touch on pregnancy. Um, so when you're traveling um, to a different destination, you need to consider the med medical aspects of that destination that you're traveling to. So uh, ensure that before you leave that you've checked the health requirements for that area and also any relevant immunizations, but also how long in advance you need to have those immunizations. So your foreign office or your consulate or your local health service should be able to advise you. Um, so make sure that um, any medication that you may be on and need to take with you 
is not actually a banned substance in that country. So for example, some cough medicines or some painkillers or some relaxants are actually illegal in some countries. So um, just make sure that you're not inadvertently um, going to get yourself into trouble. If you're going to be in a country for more than three months, then you may need to apply for a personal export license if the drugs are listed on the Misuse of Drugs um, and Regulations Act, for example. Um, and if you're allergic um, to anything, then make sure that you wear a medical SOS bracelet so that you can identify, and anybody who finds you uh, can identify anything that you may be allergic to, because you might not be able to um, communicate that at a point that you need medical assistance. Um, but also make sure that your travel manager, or if you've got a travel um, occupational health or tra um, travel health manager in your country in your company that they're also aware of any conditions or any medicate and many medications that you might be taking but also get to understand where the local hospitals are and which are the good hospitals so it could be that the local hospital to where you're staying or where you're working isn't as good um, or as advanced as one that's maybe two or three miles down the road or, or you know much further so understand where you might go if something happens but also when you are traveling, make sure that you've got enough medication for your stay. Um, we work with International SOS and they told us that um, during the period of the ash cloud, the biggest number of calls that they got to their, um, to their nerve center were from people who had gone away and they'd only taken enough medication for the period that they were actually traveling. And so people were running out of their medication. Also, you might need to take a letter from your doctor to say that you need the medication um, and keep a list just in case you lose it or you need to get more during your stay. Um, but also make a, a, a list of the correct names of the ingredients, not just the brand names or the trade names because they may differ from country to country. And also keep the medication in its original packaging or, pa or bottles. And I can give you an example of why you might want to do that. Um, we had a traveler who um, had come back from a holiday on the continent. And she came back to a UK airport and she'd been sick with a tummy bug and she'd got some medication which she'd kept in the blister pack and she'd thrown away the box. But actually she was detained at um, the local airport. She was strip searched and kept there for four hours until they managed to get a fax from the doctor where she'd been on holiday to say that um, she wasn't a drug smuggler and these were in fact um, normal medication. Also pack your medicines in your hand luggage so that again if your bags go missing you've got um, you've got them with you. So also think about um, checking the status of, as of sorry the status of the local health facilities as we, as we just talked about. The nearest hospital to you might not be the best hospital. And other commercial organisations who do provide medical evacuation, such as International SOS, will provide a service whereby you can call them information before you travel. Again, think about the weather, uh, sorry, the water, uh, wherever you're traveling to. Keep yourself dehydrated, particularly if you're traveling to a hot country, but also make sure that the water is safe to drink. And most of us, of course, will exercise common sense in terms of not having ice in our drinks or avoiding the salads, but also don't get caught out with um, cleaning your teeth with the tap water if the, if the water isn't safe to drink. Um, and that I will carry standard um, tummy medications if I'm traveling to a, comp uh, to a country which is notorious for, for tummy bugs. Now, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes just to have a little chat with you about pregnancy. Um, for all manner of reasons, female employees may not wish to share that they're pregnant, particularly in those first three months. And so um, it could be that you or a colleague are traveling on business when you are pregnant or, or when she is pregnant um, and may be suffering from morning sickness. And I'm told um, by the ladies who've had this problem that there's nothing worse than long overland trips or um, travel disruptions, return flights, delayed, delays, etc. Um, to make you feel terrible. Um, but there's a lot of issues at stake really. If this is your first child, then you've got no medical history. Nobody knows what you're going to be like when you're pregnant um, or if there's going to be any complications. And also every woman has got a different medical background and some of them won't want to travel and others won't want pregnancy to be seen as an interference to their careers. So everybody's got a different risk profile and a different medical profile, so you can't treat everybody the same. 
Some travel vaccinations, however, may be off limits during pregnancy. And also, um, some airlines might refuse to accept a pregnant passenger over 27, over 27 weeks. So you might set off on a trip and then um, realize that if you don't get back quickly, you can't actually come back. Um, so just look at the travel insurance as well. So if you did have a premature birth in country, does your travel insurance also cover you and the baby and if the baby needs medical attention or you both need to be repatriated? Now, if you're really not comfortable um, telling your employer that you're pregnant but you've got a business trip um, coming, then it may be that you can have a chat with your occupational health department if you've got one or a HR um, team member who together you might be able to come up with another reason which is feasible as to why you um, you can't travel without having to disclose that you're pregnant um, until you're ready to do so. Um, and also um, just think about the, the standard of the travel of the medical facilities in the area that you're traveling to. Also um, pregnant ladies are at higher risk of DVT when traveling so make sure that you've got your seat belt low down and continue to keep yourself ultra hydrated. Now, I've just given you a quick taster of pre-planning for your trip, um, and there are lots and lots of different organizations, as you can see here on the screen, that can help you inform yourself um, of what to think about when you're traveling, and also who can give you advice on the different countries. So you can, you know, you can contact the local maiden voyage ambassadors, your local um, your, your local um, state department or your local government, etc. They can all give you great advice. And of course, colleagues are a fantastic source, as are um, some of the online reviews that you can find. Now, I'm going to take um, a good five minutes to um, share my favorite subject, which is hotel safety. And very quickly, um, there are things that you can do and things that the hotel can do to keep you safe. We do know, of course, of history of issues that have impacted women when they've been traveling and staying in hotels. These are very isolated incidents, but hopefully if you follow some of the tips that I'm going to share with you now, you can really um, safeguard you, yourself from anything like this happening to you. And actually, one of the biggest complaints that we get um, from hotels is that you check into a room and, and a half an hour later, somebody else tries to get into the same room because they've been double allocated that room. That is unfortunately a common mistake um, that hotels make, but if you keep your door double locked at all times, then that's not going to happen to you. So going back to the, the maiden voyage hotels that we recommend, all the hotels that are on our site um, have the double locking doors and also just complete sensitivity to the needs of female business travelers. So they've got 24-7 manned reception, um, they're not going to announce your room number out loud and they're also not going to stick you at the end of a corridor next to a fire exit or place you on a ground floor. And also they're not going to ask you um, to announce your room number out loud at breakfast. So lots and lots of things um, go into as approving a hotel. Um, and I think after today's webinar, you will also be really sensi sensitive um, to these issues. But if you can, also try and book a hotel with the key card lift access, um, also with CCTV in the corridors. And if you're traveling to an area of instability, you might want to look for a hotel that's got uniform security or vehicle checkpoints or luggage scanners as you're going in. Again, read the online reviews and check in with your peer group. Do you know anybody who's also been to that hotel? Now, British Airways also run a fantastic um, seminar on um, fire and hotel safety and they recommend taking a room between the first and the sixth floor and of course the, the penthouse suite and the, and the views aren't going to be the same on the sixth floor but what you do have is the luxury that the fire ladders will be able to reach you if there's a fire. Um, also look at the area. Is the area um, close to public transport? And you might think that's, that's good, but as an example, um, I stayed at a hotel which was very close to a train station recently, um, only about two, three minutes walk away from the train station, great in daylight, but actually um, the train station is in a very seedy area, and coming back at night, it wasn't a street that I would want to walk down. But the problem that I had is I couldn't get a taxi from the train station to the hotel, because it was probably 15 to 30 seconds drive, and a taxi driver would probably just laugh at me if I asked him to take me. So what I had to do, actually, was go to another station to get a cab to take me back to the hotel. Um, and sometimes, in lots of cities, um, the, the train station is one of the seediest areas uh, in the city, so it might be better to think about booking a hotel 
close to the venue or the um, offices of the company that you're going to visit. Again, look on Google Maps to get an idea of the area. But also don't talk publicly about where you're staying. So if you're traveling on a train um, to a major city, for example, just think about not telling everybody on the train whilst you're talking on the phone where you might be staying. And if a hotel does announce your room number, then just politely ask them to give you another room, but this time not to announce your room number out loud. Also, when you get to your room, check that both of the locks work in the room, because the last thing you're going to want to do when you've um, slipped into your pyjamas Now, if unfortunately you're staying in a hotel that doesn't have a double lock, um, you can also get yourself a door jammer. So this is the device that we mentioned earlier. Door jammer are kindly sponsoring the technology for today's webinar. Um, quite light, just weighs a little bit more than a mobile phone, um, but you can use it to, to keep your door shut. Now, if you come back late at night and you need something that's not in your room, for example, a shower cap, um, what you would also do is go to reception and ask for that. Um, I wouldn't want somebody coming to my room and also having to wait and wait for them. Are they coming? Are they not coming? Can I pop in the shower or can I not? So um, go and get that from reception rather than ask it to be sent to your room. Um, and I also like to get two key cards so that I can use one for the power slot and then I can leave the TV on in my room so that people think that my room is um, occupied. Of course, I can talk all day on hotel safety, but um, I've got some more things that I want to share with you, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, so quickly, I'm um, just having a look at um, taxis um, when you get to um, your destination. Um, safety records will vary from country to country, um, so understand how safe um, they might be where you're traveling to. Um, you know, do they have seat belts? What's the laws in terms of adequate sleep for the drivers? Is drink driving prevalent in the country that you're traveling to? Is Uber safe in the country that you're traveling to? And are they adequately insured? You might want to ask the hotel to also book a taxi for you instead. And again, make sure that you've got enough local currency and that you understand what the tipping etiquette is in that country. And also keep your luggage in the back of the car when you're traveling. Also, of course, don't use unlicensed cabs. Quickly on to other forms of transport in the country. Um, again, look at the safety record. Are you going to be comfortable? We had a member who contacted us the other week whose employer had asked them to take the night train down from the north to the south of India, and she wasn't comfortable doing that, so there were alternative routes that we could um, get, for her to get for her to get to her destination. Now, quickly moving on to um, planning meetings and leisure time. It could be that when you get to your destination that you're traveling around from um, place to place for your meetings, or it could be that you're going to your head office or you're going out to see um, clients or suppliers at headquarters that you've not been to before. And in terms of going out in the evening, it could be dinner with colleagues, or it could be that you've got some spontaneous um, ideas about what you might want to do that night. You might want to go shopping or just go out for a walk and explore the new city, or even meet up with a maiden voyage member for dinner, um, or just catch up with a friend. Um, you might even find yourself going out with the boys, um, which I'll come back to in a second. But if you do zip around a city from place to place, is there an alternative for you to hold your meetings in a hotel um, or in a members club, for example, um, so that people can come to you? That's just going to save you some time um, you know, in terms of navigating the city, but also it keeps you safer if you're in one place. But whether you're out for business or leisure, um, just be careful in terms of mentioning who you work for or which company or which country you come from, um, and also brandishing logos. Again, that could make you attractive to um, all kinds of um, spurious people. Of course, it goes without saying not to hold meetings in your hotel room, and if somebody offers to or asks if they can put their bags or their stuff in your room, that you suggest that they leave them with the concierge as well. Um, 
as I mentioned, it could be also that the boys from the office want to take you out clubbing. Um, and if you're a, a minority female, um, just remember that we um, fought hard for equality and those guys are going to see you as an equal. Um, so it may not be on their list of priorities to make sure that you get safely back to your hotel. So just think about if you're going to want to leave earlier, um, how you're going to be able to get back. Also think about uh, drink spiking, um, date break date rape drugs etc um, can be popped into your drink not just in the nightclub at two o'clock in the morning but also any food or beverage throughout the day so just be um, cognizant of um, who you're meeting um, now I'm going to just have a quick peek at social media and then I will stop uh, talking so that we can take some questions from you so as you can see on the slide there are lots of risks to sharing your travel plans or what you're doing on social media. Um, but the biggest risk is that 75% of convicted burglars actually admitted to using social media to stalk out a place to burgle. So that's people who've checked into a venue or they've shared on their, their Facebook page or their Twitter feed that they're out and about. But what that also means is that your insurance is going to be void um, if, you, if you've been found to be sharing your, um, your whereabouts on social media. So turn off your geo um, locations, your tagging, don't tell people where you're actually posting from and try and refrain from posting you know, or checking into airport lounges whilst you're travelling. But also um, sites such as Facebook are banned in China so um, that wouldn't be a good place to, to put your travel plans or arrange to meet up with friends from other countries because you won't be able to access that um, when you get in country. And also did you know that um, social media gossiping in the UAE is illegal? So that's a quick whistle-stop tour through our female traveller safety. More than delighted to answer some questions for you, uh, but also you can email me after the webinar um, if you've got any burning questions. So I hope that I didn't scare you at all, and really that I did empower you and inform you and liberate you to have the most amazing business trips, because I think it's a gift when we've been um, invited by our employers to go to a new city, um, and if we can immerse ourselves in the culture and the food and, and to meet the people, then it just enriches us as human beings, and, and what more could, could, you, could you want? Now, I'm going to pass back to Rebecca, and we'll just take a few questions from you. Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, throughout the session, people have been asking, are these slides going to be made available um, after the session? So I've responded uh, and said, yes, they are. We will be providing them along with the recording of this webinar um, to anybody who, who wants to take a second listen. Um, just a couple fabulous, of well answered. <laughs> so, so just a couple of questions for you, Carolyn, that I've seen coming through. Um, some people are asking, where can they get a door jam from? And is it feasible, if you have a door jam, that it can fit into your hand luggage if you're only taking carry-on? Yes. Um, so it comes in a nice little um, black velvet pouch. Um, it literally weighs um, just a little bit more than a mobile phone. And actually, um, the dimensions are quite similar. So it will fit in your hand luggage um, quite easily. And um, you know, if I'm travelling to a hotel that doesn't have double locking doors, I like to sleep with both eyes and both ears closed, and my door jammer allows me to do that. Okay, perfect. That's great. Um, and then we have one question coming in that says, what recommendations do you have related to drivers who will take you to a tour, to tour a city? So if people are hiring drivers that are going to take them on the tour of the city, have you got any particular um tips or, or advice that you can give? Yeah, so um, I would use a reputable um, ground transportation company before you get there. So for example, I've just been um, sailing in the Caribbean and I used a company called Groundscope who um, recommended a company to pick me up fantastic security, the car was just perfect in terms of it was spotlessly clean, I felt completely safe, at no point did the driver speed, I could tell that he was alert, he was lucid, he hadn't been drinking um, and they also did airport pickups and they did um, tourist drives as well. Okay super, so you're saying a recommended company is always the best bet? Mm. Definitely. Well, just uh, quickly, so I think there's some people on the uh, call who aren't from the US, so they're not familiar with the term TSA lock. What is that? 
Um, I don't know what TSA stands for, but actually um, it's so that the authorities um, in the US can open that lock if they need to do. Um, so actually on our website we've got a travel shop um, and in there we've got travel accessories, we've actually got the TSA lock. So if anybody is traveling to the States and they need one of these special padlocks, they can get them from our website or um, they can just Google them online and get them. Okay, super. Somebody's just answered our question for us. Apparently TSA oh, stands brilliant. for the Transport Security Administration. So thank you, oh, that sounds very Vicky technical. Johnson <laughs> and Jennifer Spa for, for that um, little insight. Okay, so just Pitching on to, you talked a bit about hotel um, hotel room numbers being announced either when you go down into breakfast and you're asked for your number um, and also uh, when you're being handed your key card and people announce in a very loud, clear, professional voice, this is your number. Um, can you just give us some tips on how to be assertive without being rude when you're asking for a change? Because obviously the last thing you want to come across as is a stroppy, awkward customer. I get downgraded to a horrible room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes, of course. So I think most hotels have been trained not to announce room numbers. Um, so I think if you can just politely you know, look at the guys that are stood behind you who may have clocked your room number, um, you can make it clear. Um, you know, could you give me another room, please? And this time, would you just, would you mind just writing the room number down for me rather than announcing it out loud? And um, and there's a very specific reason for that. And actually, I didn't I didn't over um, accentuate the point, but you know, politeness does have to come. Um, you know, secondary to your personal safety. And the reason that we give this tip is that we know of instances where women have been assaulted um, in their hotel rooms. Um, just because um, their room number and their name have been announced in reception. So bear that in mind. Um, you know, um, just if you have to spare the politeness because you're not getting the, the message across, um, isn't that better than suffering potential dire consequences? Okay, great stuff. And then just the last one, um, there's a question coming in about the way um, that the, the travel industry is changing. So there's been a few step changes that you've mentioned in the travel industry in the shape of Airbnb, Uber, um, blah, blah, car. What tips do you have when using these socially driven um, organisations to book accommodation or shared transport? Well, I'm not going to say don't use them because if that's all your budget will allow, then you are going to use them. So um, it's better that I share tips on how to use them safely. Um, and if we're looking at something like Airbnb, then look for a property that's well established, that's got good reviews, um, that you can strike up a conversation with the host before you go. Um, and also look for the reviews of people who have got a similar profile to yourself. Um, and also have a self-contained unit if you can. So by that what I mean is a place that you can actually lock yourself away. It's not necessarily a spare bedroom in somebody's house. Um, and if you get yourself to a place you know, where it is self-contained, of course, um, that person is going to have a spare key um, for the room or the, the unit that you're going to be using. But again, um, if you've got one or two, they might have two doors, for example, one or two door jammers or similar devices, then at least you can protect yourself somewhat. But again, let people know where you're going, where you're staying, and just have a backup plan. If something goes wrong, what are you going to do? Okay, that's great. So I'm mindful that we're coming to the end of our session. Um, there are still a few questions coming in. So to those people who are still asking questions, we will respond to you on an individual basis. So don't worry, you will get answers. Okay, so I'd like to say thank you to Carolyn for your great presentation today. I'm sure we've all learned a lot. Uh, what a great gift for International Women's Day. And thank you for to everybody tuning in this evening. I hope you have other events to go along to to continue celebrating the progress that women have made. Um, and I just want to say, if this material has been a benefit to you day, today, even if it was just one tip, then perhaps you would really like us to, uh, to help us support the work of Women for Women um, and maybe make a donation to help one of the inspirational women um, that you can see on their website get her life back on track. Um, I've got the, the URL is here on the on the screen for you um, and also we'll drop you an email out um, with the details of Women for Women as well. Um, it's been a pleasure to spend 
event um, this evening here in the UK with women and gentlemen all around the world. And I wish you all really safe travels.